So lecture nine here is going to be on linear classifiers. So this is going to lead into a whole bunch of different methods um, that we're going to learn. Um, but they're all going to kind of fall under the ages of linear classifiers. And uh, so we talked about KNN classification last time. And um, let's talk about linear classifiers. Um, and this is going to cover quite a few lectures, uh, maybe three or so. So just as a real quick recap, I'm going to say recall um, the Bayes classifier. I suppose Bayes should be capitalized because it's a proper noun. The Bayes classifier, which is basically the optimal 0, 1 loss classifier. And we had said that this optimal classifier could be kind of succinctly um, summarized as predicting the class y hat as the maximum as the class with the maximum probability given our data. So y hat is the argmax over possible classes C. That is the value of C that maximizes the probability that y is C given x is what we observe it to be. So the idea being is we're given some x, predict y. What should we predict y as? The value that uh, has the maximum probability under a model. Of course, in order to calculate this probability or practicality, what we do, you know, we approximate it. We kind of had two approaches of how to model this. Um, and the quick summary here is the discriminative, discriminative was to model directly this conditional distribution of y given x um, and calculate it. The example being preeminently k and n classification, which um, said basically model the probability that y is a class given the observed data. We said that's approximately, or going to be approximated by the percent of, um, of nearby training y's um, of class C. And by nearby, I mean nearby to the corresponding X. And <clears throat> KNN is what we call, or what we're going to call, a nonlinear classifier. We'll hold off on that um, for the moment. But the second type of model was called a generative model. Um, or let's say generative model, and it models first x given y and y. So it says, oh, the classes, the data we observe, the classes of, um, associated with our, with our data come from some marginal distribution of y, given we know the class, we then generate the x values we observe according to x given y. And by Bayes' rule, man, let's see, Bayes' rule says that, of course, we still want to calculate the probability of y given c, y is equal to c given x is little x. And Bayes' rule says that that is proportional 
to the probability um, of observing our x given our class was c times the probability our class was class c. So we're going to talk, see some examples of a generative model today. Um, so let me just write example. A linear discriminant analysis. Today. So before we talk about linear discriminant analysis, which is um, almost always abbreviated LDA, um, there is another, just FYI, there is another hmm, statistical method called latent Dirichlet allocation, which occasionally would be called LDA also. It is uh, not about um, classification in uh, any direct way. So uh, occasionally you might run across latent Dirichlet allocation. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about linear discriminant analysis. Okay. So let's talk about what a linear classifier is because this word linear comes up in, in in the name of this method that we're going to talk about called linear discriminant analysis. Um, so let's just say definition uh, for a linear classifier. So our base classifier, and you'll be tired of me writing this by the end of this course, says that we should predict y as y hat, which is the arg max of our classes of a certain probability oops let's say x okay so more generally we could define a classifier as classifying or predicting a class of C according to the rule arg max of some function, let's call it delta C, that takes in X, right? So the Bayes classifier is a particular example of this. say is a particular example. Um, and in that case, delta C is this probability. But you could view that probability as a function of C and X, right? So the Bayes classifier says maximize this probability. That is the optimal thing in terms of risk minimization to do for a zero one loss. For other losses or if you have other schemes, you could come up with other classifiers. You could make up your favorite classifier, make up whatever classifier you want. All you would need to do to come up with some classifier is you would just specify some function delta for each of the classes C and delta would take in your x and spit out a number. And so this delta is called the discriminant function. And um, the intuition is that higher is better. So for each of so if I observe some x for each of the classes I could calculate delta c of x and then I'm just going to pick the class with the highest value of delta c of x 
it's just a little bit of a generalization of the Bayes classifier. The Bayes classifier is a particular example where we choose delta c to be a certain probability calculation. Probability y is c given x. There's no rule from on high that that has to be the way we do this. You could come up with whatever horrible classifier you want by making up, you know, some delta c and use it. Might do well, might suck. But generalizing this way is a, is a useful way to talk about it. And so people will sometimes talk about classifiers in terms of discriminant functions. So let's say example is our Bayes classifier, but I could come up with any thing I want. Maybe delta C of X is um, some beta, yeah, let's call it some beta naught C um, plus beta C transpose X. So, or times X, right? If X is one dimensional, so this is just some linear function, right? Could be some intercept. Beta naught C plus some slope. And uh, if X has, is a kind of multi-dimensional feature, you would use a transpose. If it's one, it's just a linear kind of, you know, slope plus intercept, uh, you know, intercept plus slope times X, right? That's another example. You could come up with whatever you want. Um, delta C of X is, um, geez, what's a complicated function? Exponential of hyperbolic tangent of, um, of negative log uh, x squared. Don't use that classifier. Um, but that I guess uh, I need some. Let's I need something that depends on c here. So let's say alpha c is some constant. Okay. All right, so now it's different for each of them, potentially. Make up whatever function you want. Probably a horrible classifier. Um, could be okay. Um, we will hopefully, by the end of this course, talk a little bit about neural nets. And you get the sense this is kind of the thing that a neural net would do. Um, chain together a bunch of transformations. But... Um, so you can come up with whatever you want and come up with a classifier. Higher values mean better and uh, lower values mean worse. You pick the ones with the high values. And this makes sense. If, for example, it makes a lot of sense to choose this probability. The picture you could have in your mind in a one-dimensional case, if I have an X here and maybe I have three classes, let's say three classes, um, and I will have a discriminant function. So um, maybe my discriminant function looks like that. This is delta one of x. Uh, discriminant function for class two looks like that. Delta two. And discriminant function for class three looks like that. This is uh, delta three. So those are just three functions. And if I were to do my classification problem, if I were to look at classifying each of the values on the x-axis, what would happen? If I'm over here, where the blue function is highest, I would classify blue. So I classify, I predict class blue, if my x's are over in this area, all the way up to the point where blue ducks below green, green becomes the argmax as it were, the argmax um, uh, class. So I would basically predict the blue from everywhere up to this intersection. And then from that intersection, green dominates is the highest value all the way up to when I get to, you know, I move my x's past this point. So I would kind of predict that line up. I predict green here, 
And then from here on out, it looks like red is the, the optimal or the highest one, right? So I predict red kind of off in that direction. And um, so I would, so that's kind of partitions my space um, into blue here, green here, red here. Cool. These points here where I change from predicting blue to predicting green to predicting red. These are called decision boundaries. They're the boundaries where I change my decision. It's one way of thinking about them. And um, they're basically, or they're exactly where I in have intersections between um, between my, my, between my discriminant functions, between my delta functions. Um, okay, so that's a one-dimensional picture. You could have like a two-dimensional picture where you have maybe two covariates, x1 and x2. My discriminant functions Oops, as we said here, right? So they take in my x's. So if, they, if they're, you know, if they're multi, I guess in the second case, it's a better example. If they're multi feature, uh, x1, 2, and 3, then um, I'm, you know, it's going to be a, it's, if I say 2, x1, x2, I'm going to have, uh, you know, a surface. I'm going to have a decision. I'm going to have a, my delta function is going to be a surface, is what I'm trying to say. And um, so this is going to be hard to draw, but there will be, you know, I'm not going to try and draw the three dimensional um, pictures, but what we'll find, and the easiest way to draw this, is that there will be kind of, instead of decision points here, there'll be real kind of decision boundaries. So, it might be that over here, my red function is highest. So I'm going to predict red over there. But over in this region, green is highest. So I predict green there. Maybe here, blue is highest. Um, green is highest in that region over here. So let's say green here, green here, uh, blue here. Let's say red is highest here. And then red is highest again here. All right. It's a little hard to visualize because each of the functions, right, delta 1, delta 2, and delta 3, are these surfaces now. And you look where they intersect these decision boundaries again. So these lines here are called decision boundaries because, in this case, they're real kind of boundaries between, between the the places where it classifies one class or is another class. Um, and notice that I, you know, get for an arbitrary, um, unrestricted discriminant function, delta 1, 2, and 3, you can have these arbitrary boundaries. Um, you can have very, very complicated boundaries. And um, you can build complicated classifiers. And we'll see some of that um, in the lab, hopefully, today. OK. So that's a complicated boundary. I said we're going to define what a linear classifier is, lest we forget what we're talking about, right? So you can generally talk about um, any classifier, not just a Bayes classifier, but any classifier can basically be written in this form. And um, so our, finally, our definition, let's say a linear classifier um, is a classifier. That's a good start. Linear classifier is a classifier uh, whose discriminant 
functions are monotone, let's say increasing, um, transformations, let me reword this slightly better. A linear classifier is a classifier um, whose discriminant functions, let's say, can be transformed to linear functions um, of x, parenthetically, uh, by a increasing kind of monotone transformation. So that's a, it's a lot to unpack, right? The definition we would like is that a linear classifier has linear discriminant functions. If a classifier has linear discriminant functions, it is a linear classifier. Let's write that down. Example, if dc of x is linear in x, i.e. dc of x, delta c of x, is some beta not c, plus beta c transpose x, that's a linear function, then the classifier is linear. So let's get that out of the way. If my discriminant functions are linear in x, and by linear I mean you can write as an inner product, then the classifier is linear. However, there are classifiers where we can write them down and their discriminant functions are not linear, but they are linear classifiers. So the definition, that seems weird, we'll talk about why it's not, but the definition is more encompassing. A classifier is linear, not only if its discriminant functions are linear, but if, if um, we say a classifier is linear, uh, a linear classifier is a classifier whose discriminant functions can be transformed to linear, to a linear function of x, by an increasing monotone transformation. So, example, there is some transformation. Let's say there is a monotone, let's say technically it should be non decreasing. transformation T so that if I look at T of delta C of X, this can be written as some linear function, beta not C plus beta C transpose X, right? So the reason there is a, right, the reason there's a C on these is because they're go with class C, right? So beta naught C is the intercept for class C and beta C is the slope for class C. So it's not just that the a linear classifier is not a classifier whose decision to whose discriminant functions are themselves linear, but if we can transform them to linear with a kind of not too aggressive transformation, something that's not, it's just an increasing transformation. So let me, let me write, for example, t is log of x. If taking the log of my discriminant function gives me a, um, the t of x is log of x. If taking the log of my transformation is, gives a, taking a log of my discriminant function gives me a linear discriminant function, we're okay. You know, t of x is, um, 
that's another um, exponential of x. Is there another good example of an increasing function? Doesn't matter. Uh, we'll see some actually. This is called the logistic function, this one. Okay, so this is still a bit strange because I've only kind of made some vague comments about why this is reasonable. Certainly, if the discriminant function is linear, it's linear. But also, it's if you could transform it to linear with an increasing function, it's linear. Why? Another kind of way you could think about linear classifiers is that the decision boundaries of linear classifiers is linear, are linear. It's kind of an alternative definition, although for theoretical reasons it's less a little less useful, but well, sometimes. The decision boundaries of a linear classifier are linear. That's really what we're trying to get at here. So let's think about what a decision boundary is. If we go back up to our picture here, decision boundary is the places where we switch from one to the other. Where do we switch from one to the other? Where, you know, over here, the green was higher, and then over here, the red is higher. So at some point, green is equal to red, and then we switch over. So the boundary is the point at which the two functions basically are equal. And it's kind of, you, in many classifiers, you just flip a coin if you don't have a preference. If you get to a point where the two, where the two highest uh, discriminant functions give you the same value, you don't really have a preference. And that will happen on these boundaries, and that's what they are. It's higher here, and then eventually it will hit a point higher over the red. And so what happens is there's a point where they're equal. Okay. So decision boundary of a linear classifier is linear. So let's draw the picture. This is a linear classifier. Red predicted over here, blue predicted over here, green predicted over here. So this is linear. It's a linear classifier. I know that because its decision boundaries are linear. This is a nonlinear classifier because in my x space, which is my square here, the decision boundaries are not linear. They're not lines. So nonlinear. What does that have to do with monotone transformations? Think about a decision boundary. A decision boundary is um, is uh, where let's say how do we want to say this? Decision boundary is where the two discriminant functions, let's say delta c and some delta. Uh, C prime of X. So if I just had two classes, let's just, let's build an example where you have two classes. This is easiest to build your intuition. So let's say C1 and C2. What would my decision boundary be? It is the X's where these two things are equal. So this is my decision boundary. And so the condition that, that defines a decision boundary is where the discriminant functions are equal to each other. It's, it's, you're literally setting up an equation and you would solve it for x. And it would tell you there's a certain set of these x's where this is true. You solve the equations, you get the x's where it's true. If that set of solutions here is nonlinear, we have a nonlinear classifier. If it's linear, we have a linear classifier. So if 
So the condition here that we care about is that delta C1 of X is equal to delta C2 of X. And uh, if, if delta class 1 and uh, why am I calling it C1 and C2? Can we just say 1 and 2? That, that makes a hell of a lot more sense. Jeez. Delta 1, delta 2. There we go. If delta 1 and delta 2 are linear in X, then so is the solution set. This is basically linear algebra, right? <clears throat> Where, uh, you know, if, if for example, e.g., uh, we have beta not 1 plus beta 1 x is equal to beta not 2 plus beta 2x, so this is my delta 1, delta 1 of x, and this is delta 2 of x. My decision boundary would be all x's that satisfy this, and, and we can solve it. I can try and solve it. Let's see how bad, you know, right? So I'd move these over. Difference in the intercepts. Um, I think I could solve this in one step. Um, let's make this more interesting. Because if I, if I do this for just one x, we're just going to get a single point, right? So my decision boundary in the univariate case is just going to be just a single point, right? That, but it would be more interesting in a two-dimensional case. So let's assume that we have vectors x. Um, so we move those, let's see what our steps, we move the intercepts to one side and then we move things around, uh, delta beta two minus beta one transpose X. And um, this, so I'm just gonna leave it here, linear algebra. What's my, what's my set of X gonna be, All right? I could ask this, I could ask this in a linear algebra class. We prove in a linear algebra class that that linear algebra says the solution set is a subspace or a linear subspace. So certainly if these two things are linear functions, my solution set is going to be a linear subspace. And so my decision boundary is going to be a linear subspace. And so I'm going to get something, you know, in the two-dimensional case, um, what I'm going to get is, uh, if I, or sorry, in the two-class case, I'm going to get some subspace. We'll classify one color on one side and another color on the other side. And that's all, clearly, that's all linear decision boundary, right? And the multi, multi-class case is just a little bit harder. You have to think about your solution set, but it's going to be, um, it's going to be defined by, these half these half planes, right? So you're gonna get intersections of half planes, and that is what we consider a linear set. So okay, so certainly if my as I said in the first example here, if my discriminant function is linear, then or my discriminant functions are all linear, then my solution set is linear and my decision boundary is linear. This all makes sense. Linear, 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 great. What about this transformation? So let's look at a second example. Notice that arbitrary increasing transformations of my class of, of my discriminant functions don't actually change my classifier. So if T is, let's say, increasing, then if my classifier were originally to say y hat is arg max over my classes of some discriminant function, right? If 
I have some t that is an increasing function, I can throw that t in there, and that changes nothing. So adding t, t gives exact same classifier. And so what that the knock-on effects are that class that decision boundaries I suppose three boundaries are the same. I'm gonna classify each x exactly the same. Why is that true? Why can I throw an arbitrary monotone transformation in there? The example to keep in mind is something like this. So maybe I have a Bayes classifier with three classes. Um, and I calculate the probability y is 1 given x. I calculate the probability y is 2 given x. And I calculate the probability that y is 3 given x, right? And my Bayes classifier would say I calculate these three probabilities. Maybe it's 0.5, uh, 0.3, and the last one better be 0.2. So I have my three classes. And my Bayes classifier would say, aha, class one has the highest probability. And therefore, my y hat is uh, you know, one, is class one. OK, what if I, I set, for example, pick a different color, t is uh, x squared. Now, x squared is monotone for positive numbers. It's increasing as long as x is positive, right? I should call that t of x, shouldn't I? t of x, x squared. OK, so I'm going to instead look at t of the probability, and t of this probability, and t of this probability, right? Well, that would be 0.5 squared, 0.3 squared, 0.2 squared. But it's a monotone function. And so it respects the ordering. That's basically what, what increasing functions do, right? That's what it means. It, it respects the order. So if 0.5 is bigger than 0 0.3, 0 0.5 squared is bigger than 0 0.3 squared. So it doesn't change the ordering of these. And it won't change which one we pick as the largest. If 0.5 was the largest start, then 0.5 squared will be the largest as long as my t, as long as my squaring in this case, is monotone. So I can throw in an arbitrary monotone transformation, and it won't change the argmax. It would change what the maximum value is, but it won't change the argmax. So if you thought about mm, maximum likelihood estimators, we work with either the likelihood or the log of the likelihood. Logging the likelihood didn't change our answer. So whenever you're taking 452, that's meaningful if you haven't, not meaningful. But you can do this arbitrary transformation, and it's not going to change my answer. So if so if there exists a t that makes sorry about that so my computer died let's uh, continue on with the last couple minutes of our lecture here and hopefully uh, my machine won't die on me again uh, just had a couple more comments before we talk about linear discriminant analysis and all I was saying is that so you know. If we have, um, not only do we need the, the uh, discriminant functions themselves be linear, but if we have, if there exists some transformation t that makes the, the discriminant functions linear, then our classifier is equivalently specified by saying that we are that we look to maximize the discriminant functions themselves, or you could equivalently say we maximize some transform version of the discriminant functions they give us the exact same answer at all points so they're the same classifier and if this thing is linear then our decision then the equivalent way of looking at our classifier is as um as having a linear discriminant function and so the decision boundaries can be linear another way um way to view this, for example, is if I have, as before, if, you know, I have just two classes, delta, and then so I'll have two discriminant functions, delta 1 and delta 2, then my decision boundary would be defined um, uh, 
is defined here by the place where the x's make these equal, and you might be worried, well, if they're both nonlinear, is, is that going to cause a problem? But if I can find some t that makes these both linear, then the solution space is going to be linear, and so my decision boundary is going to be linear. So linear classifiers are, are deceptively large class of classifiers. If we go back up, way back up to our definition, it is a linear classifier is, back up, a classifier is linear. It's not even what I write, wrote either. A linear classifier is a classifier whose discriminant functions can be transformed into linear functions of x by an increasing transformation. And that's a large class of classifiers because not only that that you need linear um, discriminant functions. It's just any, there has to be some way we can make these things into linear through monotone transformations. So one such example, and the kind of pinnacle example we're gonna look at today, is called linear discriminant analysis. Or LDA. And I said that this was um, a generative method. And LDA is going to try to approximate the Bayes classifier. And so, you know, our Bayes classifier said that we should try to calculate the probability that y is each of our classes given x um, is equal to the little observed x naught that we observe. And so this is course, our discriminant function for class C is the probability y is C given this, uh, given our x's. And we said that we can basically use Bayes' rule, and this is kind of proportional, or is exactly proportional, to the probability that x is equal to little x given y is equal to C times the probability that y is equal to C. And we can ignore the denominator in this in this rearrangement of Bayes rules because it doesn't depend on C. And since we maximize over um, over C, it doesn't matter if we multiply everything by a constant or not. Um, so we can just ignore that denominator, right? Let me let me write it in and make and make the argument, right? So technically. Our Bayes rule would say we have to divide through by this probability. Probability x is equal to our observed x. This denominator doesn't depend on c. And so maximizing the whole thing is the same thing as maximizing uh, just the numerator. Because if I look at our max of f of x, this is the same thing. So if I were to maximize generically some f of x, that's the same thing as arg max of any constant times f of x, right? The constant is not that it will change the maximum value, but it won't change the x at which that maximum is attained. So we can always ignore our constants, anything that doesn't depend on x. In, the, in this case, I guess our x and our c are, are inverted here, but it'd be anything that doesn't depend on my class c because we're arg maxing over c. Maybe I should change my variables here. If we're arg maxing over over y, right? It doesn't really matter. And then I have some constant k, right? Um, so we can ignore that denominator. Linear. So this is just kind of the general setup for generative methods. Linear discriminant analysis. Um, is going to model this um, where, so what we need to do this is we need to model both how our x's are generated given the y's and what our underlying distribution, what's often called the prior distribution of the y's is. So LDA. It's not beat around the bush more. LDA models x, given my class, y, as 
Gaussian or normal, normally distributed, normal, and y as some arbitrary, arbitrary, arbitrary discrete distribution. Let's look at it for a one dimensional case. So let's say our covariates are x is just some real number, i.e. the dimension of our covariates is 1, so p is 1. L, what LDA is going to do, so this is our example, is going to say that x here is our one-dimensional, our univariate random variable, has the following distribution. Given that the class is class C, we're going to model it as normally distributed with some mean mu that depends on the class and some variance sigma squared that doesn't depend on the class. It's going to be the same for all classes. And Y um, has just kind of an arbitrary discrete distribution the probability that y is equal to our, some class C, we're just going to call pi of C, where um, the pi sub C is sum up to 1 over my classes, and uh, they're positive, right? So this is an arbitrary discrete distribution over my k classes. You can have any, you know, any... Basically, you know, any kind of like simple probability distribution over you know, a finite number of classes. But given I'm in class C, X is going to come from some normal distribution um, with a mean that depends on the class and a variance. The variance is going to be the same across all the classes. So our example where, where we have um, for a two class problem, so two classes. Here's my space of x's, and uh, I basically have, um, I'm going to observe my data. And the data, if I have two classes, c is 1 or class is 2, I'm going to have two means, mu1, mu2, and we're going to have the same normal distribution, but with different means. So we're going to pretend that these variances, oh, I can draw these at all the same. So let's call that mu1. Let's use a different color just for the sake of it. And we'll have a second just, you know, normal distribution here. The variance here defining this width of them is the same, though. So the variance of each of these is sigma squared. We have our, our means mu1 and mu2. And so we'll observe data, maybe, you know, red squares, and they'll more likely to fall by mu1, hopefully, depending on that variance, and um, green circles, which are going to tend to fall closer to, to mu2. Although we could occasionally get a green circle out there, or you could get a red tri uh, red square out here. So they can they have some probability of overlapping. And so given that you know, so what our, our model, LDA model says is that given we're in class one, our x's, or in this case just our single x, is drawn from this distribution. So let's say this is class is equal to one. And alternatively, if the class is two, we draw from this distribution, which is located over here. So you can imagine how you would build a classifier on this. If I observe points that are kind of close to the mu2, I would say that they are, um, they come from class 2. If I observe classes that are closer to mu1, I'm going to say probably they're generated from class 1, because that's what we know, right? And uh, that's kind of the model we're assuming. There's a little bit of, um, we might have, now if we have 50-50, that's probably exactly what we'll do. But it's possible we'd also need to model 
what's the prior probability? Maybe like we get twice as many mu twos or things coming from class two as we do class one. So if that were true, we should just generally expect to get more things of class two than class one. And so we might adjust this a little bit. We might say, we might actually right, push the decision boundary from being right in between them to, uh, to giving class two a more likely um, uh, likelihood of being chosen. Um, in, so this is kind of the, the one dimensional case and, uh, in this case, we can actually kind of write down and do some algebra on what the actual decision boundary is. Um, so again, let's, let's do our derivation for P is equal to one. Um, and next time we can talk about, uh, or maybe if we get time this time, we can talk about the case um, where we have more than one x, so we have a multi-dimensional x, right? But <clears throat> this modeling here gives us everything we need to know because we can calculate probability x given y is equal to c and probability y is equal to c. Okay. So let's just write it down. X given Y is equal to class C, norm, normal mu C sigma squared, and uh, the probability that Y is equal to C, we're just gonna call that pi C. So we have a couple unknown parameters. We don't actually a priori know what mu is, what sigma squared is, or what the pi's are. Here's the word, we're going to learn them or you could say estimate them. Estimate such an old, old fashioned word. We're gonna learn them these days, right? From training data. And we'll use those. So if my training data in this case were, you know, I saw my green circles here and my red, and my red squares here, I would estimate my mean, hope my mean to be for the reds to be here the the uh, greens to be over here and then you pool the variance you do some kind of estimate the variance we'll talk about it but um so basically you estimate these from the training data not too surprising so that's in the same way that regression simplified from this infinite dimensional space all the way down to um just a p-dimensional space we're gonna have a couple you know we're gonna have a couple parameters we simplify the problem by adding structure to it adding structure of normality, adding structure of other, you know, in these ways. Okay. So let's actually do the derivation. What I want to, you know, all I need to do is I need to tell you what delta C of X is, right? Which is this probability Y is this, given my data. Um, and uh, what we're really going to use, let's say really use, is delta c of x we're going to basically abuse this this Bayes rule and we're just going to look at the probability x is x given y is my class times probability y is in my class right and that's basically the same kind of thing but the monotone transformation of that uh top one using Bayes rule so once i specify this literally the way you implement it is you calculate you do the calculation for each class given an X and you choose the class with the largest X. Simple as that. So let's write this out. Probability X given Y C is normal. So let's write out the PDF over normal. So I'm using the word probability here. Really it should be PDF, but no one, no one's going to point that out, are they? So here is my normal distribution as a mean mu c, All right? That's the canonical normal distribution. <clears throat> Let's see, two pi sigma squared. Yep, that seems about right. And then probability y is equal to c, we just call pi c. And um, so that's all cool. 
it's going to be nicer in our case to show that this thing is, we're going to actually show us that this thing is linear. So let's actually, so we had a sign delta C to be this thing. Let's kind of update it to be the log of this thing. All right, we can apply monotone transformations, right? And nothing changes. So let's actually work the log of this. So we'll take the log of this whole expression as log as monotone. We could work the log instead. Uh, it doesn't change anything about our classifier. It's a monotone transformation. So what do we get? We get negative one half log of two pi. I'll do this a little quickly. Um, let's just write two pi sigma squared, right? Easy enough, minus one over two sigma squared x minus mu c squared plus log pi c. And um, we can ignore this because um, I don't want to say this. We can ignore it because you could just add on. It doesn't depend on C. And so you could always just add it on um, or equivalently think of it um, as a monotone transformation. This doesn't depend on C. And so we can ignore it. So that's the nice thing about the discriminant functions. As I've done with that denominator up here, this probably x is x. Anything that doesn't depend on c, you can basically excise out of your discriminant function because it's not going to matter when you're doing the argmax. And so I'm going to say, okay, let's assign to our thing. Let's, our delta c of x is going to be, um, let's just look at this last part. Let's actually square it out. So it's 1 over 2 sigma squared. And then this is x squared minus 2x mu c plus mu c squared plus log of pi c. And um, that is equal to some rearrangement negative uh, mu c squared over 2 sigma squared plus x mu c over sigma squared. And uh, we can also, nope, not that, ignore for same reasons. x, this x squared term is not going to depend on c. You can remove it from your discriminant function. And so we're going to ignore it. And we'll have a log of pi c on the end. So what we're doing is we're deriving the discriminant function. We're just, I mean, right? This is how you'd actually calculate it. You're deriving the discriminant function. And um, so this is what we get. This is kind of the actual discriminant function people would use to calculate um, LDA. We saw this just either a linear or monotone transformation of, of, of the original version we started off with, which was following you know normal distribution and some arbitrary discrete distribution. And um, has certain parameters, which we'll need to estimate. So we'll talk about that. But notice, so in reality, because we don't know mu c, we don't know sigma squared, we don't know pi c, need to estimate mu c's sigma squared and the pi's for each of the classes. How? Super simple. The mu c, mu c hat, let's say, is equal to mean of x's in, oh, let's say, our training xn's. Actually, write that out. Training xn's in class c. So all you do is you go and say, okay, all my tra my training x's that have a corresponding y in class c, take the mean of them. My sigma squared is going to be some kind of pooled 
variants. Um, basically, we're gonna pool the variants across, right? So we're gonna estimate the variance for these two and calculate it as a weighted average. Um, not too important, but we're gonna, it's just a, you know, like from an intro stats, it's called a pooled variance. Um, so sigma squared hat, and then the pi c's, pi c hat, is just the percentage of training data in class C. And that's exactly what you think it would be. Um, and so at the end of the day, maybe I should put a box around this one, the discriminant function, we replace, um, Actually, let's just write it up there. Let's undo, undo. Come on, Let's see if I can break my computer again here. Um, we're just going to replace these in here with hats, hats, and hats, and everyone gets a hat. We estimate them. We learn them. Notice that, and this would be pretty much the last point. For LDA, let's see if I can get this right. Um, negative mu c hat squared over two sigma squared hat. Did I add enough hats in here? Oh, you need a hat. Okay. And uh, then we say it's uh, plus, let me write it this way, plus mu c hat over sigma squared hat of x. plus log pi c hat. Now, um, I'm going to collect this term and this term, and we're going to call those beta naught c hat. And I'm going to collect, well, let's get a different color here. I'm going to collect this term and call it beta uh, C hat. Then, what do we get? My discriminant function for LDA is beta naught C hat plus beta C hat times x. So LDA is linear. It just has a fancy intercept and slope. But all this is a linear classifier. That's pretty cute. So let me rehash just through the lecture here real quick. So we talked about classifiers and how you can define them more generally in terms of discriminant functions. The optimal discriminant function for our classes, you know, so you have one discriminant function per class. The optimal one, according to the zero one loss, would be the this probability calculation here, and that would give us what's called the Bayes classifier. But you could generally just define some kind of arbitrary ones, and the places where the discriminant functions are equal will define their decision boundaries where we move from classifying in one type to another type. A linear classifier is basically any classifier whose decision boundaries are linear. Or another way of thinking about it is that the discriminant functions are either linear themselves or can be transformed pretty simply to being linear by a monotone transformation. We talked about why that makes sense, why not some good things. The simplest and first um, linear uh, classifier is called linear discriminant analysis. It models things it models this probability, so it's proxy or approximates this probability. So it's trying to approximate the Bayes classifier, and it does that by making some modeling assumptions. Just like linear regression makes this global linear assumption, linear discriminant analysis makes assumptions about some Gaussianity of the x's, conditional on the class, and a kind of very simple um, description of the class probabilities, the prior class probabilities. And this is definitely the picture you should have in mind with LDA. 
In the simple case, where we just have one x, and we'll do multiple x's next time, we can directly derive the discriminant function. So we did some kind of derivation. I mean, basically, the, all we're doing is using our normal probability, or normal density, and this class prior density, the pi's. And you can do some manipulations and get into a certain form. The parameters are the means of each of the classes, which we estimate just as the means of the training data classes. The variance, which we estimate as a pool of variance, it's not actually that important to get into all the details of what that means. Uh, if we have some time next time, we can talk about it. And then the class uh, prior probabilities, probability where one class over another class, which we just have to make as a percentage of the training data from one class versus another. So all we do is we just estimate those and we plug them in and we get our discriminant functions. And literally the way this is implemented in say R, and we'll write our own implementation, but is you calculate the means, you calculate the variances, it's like two lines in R, and then you form this discriminant function and then Given an x, how do I tell you what I'm going to estimate the class as? What am I going to classify it as? I calculate the discriminant function for each of my classes, and I say, which one has the largest? That class. And the last point is, we said this thing's linear, and it is. You can rearrange the terms here and write it as some intercept plus some slope times x. That's what all my discriminant functions look like, so it's linear. Notice to get it into this linear form, we had to do some manipulations. So anything that doesn't depend on C, you can basically ignore. And I had to take a log at one point, right? So I used this monotone log transformation, but that's allowed. It doesn't change my classifier. So next time we'll talk about um, LDA. We'll broaden it out to, to more than one um, X at a time, you know, feature vector of X's, very simple. Um, and we'll talk about some extensions um, to this. But we'll stop here for today.